Hey folks, it's Marvin Cash, the host of The Articulate Fly, and we're back with another episode of our special edition On the Beat with my favorite co-host, Tucker Horn. How's it going, Tucker? Hey, I'm doing good, Marvin. I'm excited to be back on the show and hosting another episode of On the Beat with you. Yeah, it's going to be great. And hey folks, as we mentioned before, this is an experiment, and we'd love to bring this, this show to you regularly, but we need to get some feedback about what you like, what you don't like. Um, do you like the news? Because we're not going to do the news this time. Uh, if it's something that's really important to you, you need to let us know. And even better, we need sponsors. So if you want to sponsor the show, if you're a shop or a guide or a team, reach out to us on the Articulate Fly Facebook page and let us know. Let's get to our interview with a member of the Dream Team. The Dream Team medaled in three World Youth Fly Fishing Championships over three years. This show's guest was a member of that team for two of those three years. I'm confident he would have helped the team the third year they won gold in a row when Hunter Hoffler was able to take the individual gold medal and the team took the team gold medal. This episode's guest won the 2013 team gold medal in Ireland. The following year, he won the 2014 individual gold medal and team gold medal in Poland. He's a big part of the U.S. youth fly fishing team's successful legacy, and we couldn't be more excited to have him on the show. Gabe Wittosh is an incredible person, an incredible angler, and Tucker and I are excited to sit down and have a chat with him. Well, welcome to the Articulate Fly, Gabe. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Excited to be here. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun, and a tradition we have on the Articulate Fly is uh, we always ask all of our guests to share their earliest fishing memory. Yeah, so my earliest fishing memory is uh, from back when I lived on Long Island, New York, um, my parents used to take me just to some local ponds to kind of mess around. You know, I'd been casting in the yard for months and, uh, my mom took me down one day, not expecting me to catch anything. And I ended up, uh, catching my first fish. It was a pretty big large mouth off the bank and, uh, never stopped after that. That's really cool. It's cool that that happened so long ago. Um, when did you start fly fishing? Uh, around three or four is the first time I got a fly rod. You know, I'd just be casting in the backyard, but first time I started catching fish on the fly was five or six when I moved from New York to Georgia, uh, just catching uh, like brim and stuff in the backyard and eventually taking it out on the Chattahoochee to chase trout. That's really cool. Um, what was it like knowing, you know, that it started so early for you? What was that transition like from just regular fishing to fly fishing? I mean, it's just fishing has been my life for, ever pretty much you know first first fish was at three and i've just been going ever since so i mean i i've always been competitive with my friends and i uh, it was always you know my main hobby and my passion versus most of the people i kind of just fish with that were just out there to have fun so it was always kind of in the back of my mind you know a little competitive edge going on um so the transition from regular fishing to comp- competition fishing came pretty easily and you know, at first it was just kind of going out and having fun and meeting new people, but it uh, quickly picked up. That's funny. I uh, talked to Calvin Kalos, the head coach of the U.S. Youth Fly Fishing Team today, and he talked about you as a competitor today. I was talking to him a little bit about getting ready for the World Championship, and he said Gabe just always had a competitive fire, whereas other kids that were on the team didn't necessarily have that competitive spirit about uh, their game. They had to work a lot harder to really want to be fierce competitors and he he actually talked about how into competition you were from the very beginning you you'd never lacked that competitive drive yeah and it's funny because i i I fished a session up in uh new york with calvin as my judge the first year i started competing it was pretty much my first really big competition and it kind of got to the point where i was doing really well and i'd already won several competitions out of my first say 10 so and when i started doing good at something like that you know i want to do better so he got to see me a lot less refined than people these days would and i i was losing fish during that session i was cursing i was pissed and he was giving me some tips and stuff but yeah it kind of as i started to do better i wanted to do better and uh it was kind of me versus me at that point if you know what i mean yeah, that's uh, that's really cool. And so as you kind of got deeper into competitive fishing, who were some of the mentors that helped you really refine your craft? Well, the first person who ever taught me at a check nymph was Jamie Sullivan from Dead Drift. Uh, I met a couple of the guys on Dead Drift at one of the local events and ended up going to a nymphing clinic and getting in touch with some of those guys. And 
started fishing with one of them, uh, Seth Sullivan, uh, pretty regularly. So those were two of the guys who kind of first inspired me to start competing and encouraged me to try out for the team. Um, going on from there, the, the person who really made, uh, made me take the biggest jump was Paul Bork, who was the head coach of the USU fly fishing team at the time I was on it. And, uh, he really showed me a lot of the techniques, you know, kind of unlocked a lot of doors that I just never really thought of. And that kind of kicked off the, uh, large growth and skill and knowledge about the sport. Um, since then, uh, another buddy of mine, Kelly Calvo, who I used to fish with a lot before I started competing, he kind of, uh, he's probably the fishiest person I know. You know, there's, uh, I know plenty of guys who are better and more technical, but I don't know anyone else who can just go out there and catch fish when it's tough better than him. So he, uh, that mindset and a lot of stuff I learned fishing with him, he was, a, he was definitely one of my biggest mentors as well. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a little bit of a mix between competitive and non-competitive people that shaped me into the angler I am today. That's cool. Who uh, told you about the U.S. youth fly fishing team? Uh, when I got on dead drift in 2012, uh, a couple of people had mentioned it to me pretty, pretty much off the bat saying that, you know, I should pursue it and definitely go to a clinic. And when I went to that first clinic in April of 2012, um, I, I knew I definitely wanted to try out for the team. That's really cool. Um, who are some of the folks that have helped your development as a competitive angler? Definitely uh, Paul Bork. Like I said, he, he played probably the largest role in kicking things off. Um, from there, honestly, more than anyone else, it was my teammates because we fished together so much and we, we all had kind of different backgrounds of, and fishing styles. So learning off of each other, you know, every time we went out, we'd pick up something from another person. And, you know, we might say, hey, maybe you try this. And then they say, well, I actually do it like this. And, you know, it kind of clicks in your mind and you end up adopting their way versus yours or you know they say you see them do something wrong and you point it out to them and it clicks for them so we that was the uh the biggest part of our success was learning from each other and trusting each other enough to be able to try different things and uh learn that way so definitely paul starting me off but then honestly you know there's obviously the other coaches on the team chris lee josh stevens uh, mac brown taught me a lot and I'm sure I'm forgetting others, but uh, I'd say more than anything, I learned from my teammates. Talk to me about, a little bit about uh, those guys that were on the team when you won individual gold and the relationships you had with them and still have with them today. Well, it was, uh, I mean, it, it got to the point where I, I really didn't see anyone else but them. You know, every waking moment that I wasn't in school, which was a lot because I, I went to a school where I only went two days a week. So pretty much every other day I was fishing with those guys. Um, so, we, you know, we obviously got really close. We were together every weekend, usually a few days during the week, going out and fishing pretty much anywhere, just trying new water, learning new things. Um, on the uh, the 2014 team was myself, Cam Chiaffi, Hunter Enlow, Hunter Hoffler, and Mason Sims, with Andrew Brown as the alternate in Poland. Um and uh, I traveled all over the place with Hunter fishing. Uh, we went and pre-fished Ireland together and Poland. Uh, so we definitely had a special bond and a, a really good connection on the team just from how much extra time we spent together. Uh, we traveled out west together after some of the bigger tournaments out there. Um, so I, I'd say out of anyone, Hoffler and I definitely had the, uh, the best mojo and we really learned a lot from each other. Um, that's and, uh, yeah, yeah. That's really cool. And so you know, you're relatively elite young, but you fished competitively for a long time. How long have you fished competitively? Going up on uh, seven years now. I started in 2012. Got it. And we talked a little bit about Poland and Ireland. Where are some of the other places you fished? So for trout, I've fished in Oregon, Colorado, Wyoming, Idaho. Uh, New York, Pennsylvania, all throughout the Southeast, uh, quite a few places in the U.S. Uh, overseas, I've fished in Ireland, Poland, Slovakia, um, and the Czech Republic. Um, Non-trout related, I've, I've gone some other places. You know, I've gone uh, down to Turks and Caicos recently. I spend a lot of time saltwater fishing in Florida these days. Uh, I've traveled a good bit, of, good bit of the globe fishing so far. That's really cool. And I know, you know, you really, I, I've read some of your bio stuff. I mean, you basically 
got a taste of competitive fishing. And the next thing we know, you're on the U.S. you know youth team traveling around the world competing and winning medals. What do you attribute that rapid rise from just getting into competitive angling to being one of the premier youth competitive anglers? Well, it, it's kind of cool how it started. You know, it, it did start really fast. I uh, tried out for the team and I ended up taking a uh, third place, winning the bronze medal in my first youth nationals. And that earned me a spot on the uh, America's Cup team for that year where we won bronze as well, which was the first time the youth team had placed out there. Um, but I'd say it was kind of go, kind of going back to what I was talking about that time fishing with Calvin. Um, when I get good at something, you know, I just want to be better. And uh, I take it really hard when I make mistakes that I, as a, as an angler, know better than, or can you know, I do it a hundred times in a row and then mess it up. And I remember that one time. So just that, that kind of fire to get better and uh, best myself. Um, but overall, you know, just time on the water, uh, after that first world championships, you know, I was scheduled to go off to college, but ended up taking a gap year. So, I mean, it was six, seven days a week, sun up to sundown, competing, uh, with myself on the water, whether it was in a competition or not. And, uh, just, just spending that time, you know, it, we, we took it very seriously going into Poland. You know, we were, we, it was a very brand new team going to Ireland. Uh, we were all obviously really skilled at that point, but going into Poland, we, we knew that we could, you know, do something special. So, I mean, everyone had their own kind of little niche things that they were doing. Uh, I spent almost a month fishing left-handed, you know, learning how to fish left-handed just in case something went wrong. And just, you know, sometimes it helps to be able to fish ambidextrously. Uh, plenty of other people were, you know, trying different leaders, different techniques, doing, you know, fish only something that you're bad out for a week or two straight. Um, so it's just kind of going that extra mile that most people in the sport won't go, you know, focusing on building on what you're good at, but also really refining things that you aren't so good at. Um, it's a, all those factors that kind of contribute to you rising in the ranks. You know, you got to take it seriously and do things that no one else is doing. Yeah, that's really interesting. I'm really curious. Are you as competitive in other parts of your life as you are in fishing or is fishing kind of where you channel all of your competitive energy? No, I, you know, I played sports in college. Uh, I actually played uh, ultimate Frisbee on the U UGA team the entire time I was there. And uh, I've, I've always played sports, whether it was, you know, first it was baseball, soccer, basketball. I played just about everything. Um, so I've always had that competitive drive. But, you know, fishing, like I said, it's the most important, important part of my life. So I, I definitely spent more time and got more enjoyment out of competing in that than anything else. I definitely think I know the answer to this question, but maybe you'll surprise us with something different. So far, what's your favorite memory as a competitive angler? Uh, do you have any like favorite accomplishments or something funny, or is it strictly business and winning gold medals? Well, you know, before that, before we went to Poland, you know, it, it got to the point where it was it was strictly business. You know, we we all took it. You know, we were out there competing for our country you know we we really took it seriously um since then i've made a conscious effort i pretty much don't keep competing unless i'm ready to go have fun and it's more about seeing people these days than anything else um but I, i'd say probably my favorite memory is uh yeah it probably will surprise you it's, it's from the 2013 world in ireland um there was a there's a venue on that uh that world it's called the Quiggery River and uh some background offler and i went over there and pre-fished and it was some of the best fishing i've ever had and then from the day we left to look, the day of the competition they probably got less than half an inch of rain huge drought uh and the rivers over there were extremely small no shade they're not like over here where you got hemlocks everywhere they were going through cow fields so absolutely no shade and the quiggery river was shallow slow moving no shade, literally cow pastures on each side. So that turned into the kind of the venue of death over there. Um, that was where the competition was won. We had uh, Cam caught several fish and uh, took a one on there. Then it went all the way through a couple of sessions. You know, people, most of the field blank, you know, out of nine competitors, usually two to three would catch a fish. Um, and when I got there, you know, it was a, it was a section that I was familiar with. I had fished there in pre-fishing. <clears throat> Obviously, you know, it's, it's 
inches and inches lower. There's barely any holding water. But as I'm walking down my beat, I see something rise. And I said, I mark it in my mind. I said, all right, that might be the only fish in my beat. Uh, but I start at the bottom. I'm working up and I, I get up there about an hour into my session. And I take a cast. You know, it, was, it was very, very technical. We were fishing 8X long leaders on nymphing sticks so that you could have some more uh, spring when you set the hook. I take my first cast up there and it floats down past where the fish had risen. And I was like, all right, well, my, uh, I was, you know, halfway through the drift in my head, I'm already thinking, do I need to leave it alone? Do I need to cast again? And while I'm thinking and watching my fly, this, this small brown jumps out of the water to eat it, it lands in the water. And for, for anyone who knows, especially fish that are jumping to eat, you know, they're, they're eating caddis or something like that. It is a very slim hookup ratio. You might hook, one out of three if you're lucky when they're eating that heavily and uh, as the fish went de- back down in the water i let you know let milliseconds pass set the hook and felt the fish on the end and you know i knew that i needed to get that fish in that was probably going to be the only eat i got the whole session so it, i mean it all happened in probably five seconds it was probably a 30 40 foot cast he ate about 30 feet away um comes back down towards me i transition the side pressure the other way swims back up aerialized into the net and just let you know sigh of relief out you bring it in it measures you know a mere 23 centimeters beautiful little brown and sure enough that was the only fish that i saw on my beat the only eat i got and uh one of my favorite memories is, is, is that but it's also paul bort coming through halfway through the session to check and my i was still in that same spot it was no more than five minutes ten minutes after i caught that fish and i saw him walk up I hear a mumble of something about any fish and my mom, my dad answered. And I just uh, look up there on the bridge and see his arms go up and him scream. Yes. Um, and sure enough, that was, if I didn't catch that fish, we wouldn't have caught uh, one gold in Ireland because Cam and I were the only ones to catch fish on that venue. And uh, that's how close it was in Ireland. You know, one, one blank or one less fish on a session was the difference between us winning. So that's, that's my favorite competitive memory is that one little brown trout on the Quigley in Ireland. Well, that's a super cool story and it's a pretty good transition to talk about your preferred gear setup. Now, if you could kind of walk us through your rod and leader uh, and terminal tackle setup that you like to use when you fish today. These days I'm primarily, uh, fishing a 10 and a half foot master nymph three weight. Um, back then I really didn't like fishing longer rods than 10 foot. Um, but I've kind of transitioned into fishing this master nymph. It's a lot lighter than rods were back when I competed. So got a, a lot better recovery. It's a lot quicker. Um, and that was one of my main kind of, uh, gripes with the 11 footers. Cause you know, back then there really weren't any 10 and a half. It was 10 or 11, 11 foot rods, you know, that extra foot, your hook set slower, you fight fish differently. And I just didn't like it, but, uh, I've, I've really started enjoying fishing 10 and a half foot rods. Um, to the point where if I fish something that's less, you know, it, it no longer, it feels more like I'm fishing a nine foot rod. So that's, that's my primary setup. Uh, I've got a hardy ultralight reel, same reel I bought back in 2013 that I, I just keep, keep using on all my rods. Uh, I also fish a lance and conic sometimes, but primarily that hardy ultralight. Um, and as far as rod and reel goes, that's, a, I really haven't switched it up much. I used to fish a graze. I fish a master nymph now and stick with that, uh, hardy ultralight reel. Talk to us a little bit about your leader. Uh, so that's uh, my leader is kind of an interesting story. It's kind of well known as being Gabe's leader in the competitive community because uh, no one else fishes anything like it. I, I literally fish straight 10 pound test to 10 pound cider pieces and that's it. No kind of taper. You know, I, that's what I started off fishing with. Yeah. You know, I tried some other leaders. I found a few that are okay, but, I, I, since 2012, I've fished a straight 10 pound test leader. And once you get used to it, there's so much more that you can do with it compared to, you know, a, a normal leader. I, I can fish 30, 40, 50 feet away with somewhat small flies and still get a good drift and keep a connection. So I've, I've uh, you know, it's a, it's a broke, ain't broke. Don't fix it. And I've uh, kept that my entire time. I hear that. That's really cool that you do something different. It's not uh, what most people would think of. Uh, as a typical leader setup for a competitive angler. Um, is there any pieces of gear that you use that might surprise us? Well, the leader would have been a big one because, you know, everyone's kind of, they, they all are interested to ask, like, oh, what kind of leader are you use? And then they kind of just give you a funny look when you tell them. But uh, 
I've uh, one thing I did is in 2014 I, I transitioned to a vest. I use the uh, Umqua Tech vest, and you, you don't see very many people out there fishing in vests in the U.S. But Umqua sent us a bunch of stuff for Poland, and I figured I'd give it a try, and I've actually really enjoyed it. So I, I've gone with a vest pretty much exclusively from uh, there on out. That is a very big difference in uh, amongst most competitors, as most people are using a chest pack, and it's kind of cool that you use a vest. It's just not really what most people think of when they think of a competitive angler is one wearing a vest. Yeah, I mean, and it, it's, it's definitely unique, but uh, I find that it holds as much, if not more, and it's way more out of the way. It feels way lighter. It's a lot more comfortable. And when you're fishing, you know, six hours in a day in a big high level competition, you start to get pretty worn out. And something as little as being more comfortable can make a big difference. Yeah, that's uh, that's really interesting. Yeah, I, I gosh, I haven't fished a vest in a thousand years. That's uh, that's really interesting. I, I know you're you're pretty young, but you recently graduated from college, and you're now in the real world. And why don't you tell us how that's impacted your fishing and your competing life? Well, to be honest, after after that 2014 world, I was absolutely burnt out. Um, I fly fished one time. In my first semester at college, I went up to my favorite stream, caught some big fish, and then put the rods up and really didn't touch them again until probably the next spring, you know. Um, but I, I started picking up back up a little bit more during college. I, I, I do the Casting for Hope series of tournaments every year, um, big gold-level tournament, three-day tournament in uh, April, and then another one in Cherokee that was actually this past weekend uh, in July usually. So I always do those. I usually do the gold cup put on by dead drift. Um, I kind of, like I said, I was burnt out, but I've kind of, I kind of found my, my niche group of tournaments that I, I really enjoyed fishing and, uh, that I got to see all my friends doing. So that, that was kind of dr- what drove it. I would go and fish with people I'd never fished with before on team events and kind of just enjoy being around the people I'd been friends with for so long, but uh, I was too busy, com- like, competing with that high drive mentality to kind of just sit back and enjoy a tournament with. Um, so I started doing a little bit more fly fishing and I, I spent a few summers, uh, guiding and, uh, doing a lot of, a lot of small stream fishing. Um, so throughout college, it was primarily small streaming, a few comps here and there, and then guiding, um, after towards the end of college and after college, I, I've really picked up on the saltwater fishing game. Um, I bought a skiff, I spent a lot of weekends down in Florida. I traveled to Turks and Caicos, like I'd mentioned, uh, planning on heading back there in December and down to Florida here again this weekend, probably. Uh, so I, I definitely don't have as much time, but that's fine. Cause it, like I said, I was pretty burnt out. So now, now that I've kind of taken a step back, it's, it's something I immensely look forward to is having that time to go and fish. That's really cool. Do you have any desire to make the adult team one day? I made the adult team back in, 2013 i believe it was um placed fairly high i think i was either you know 11th or 9th on on the team uh point standing but back then you couldn't be on both the youth and adult team uh they made that rule because too many youth kids were making it too and uh <laughs> they figured well, they, they'd leave us to the youth team until we turned you know 18 19 and then could go for the adult team um I, I don't have any desire at the moment I, I i'm sure it'll pick back up here in the next few years i'll consider making it um, a couple of my friends, you know, a couple of guys on the, the dream team, as you call it, have, uh, been talking and there's some, there's some murmuring about starting to kind of get the band back together. And there's a couple of people, uh, like Cody Bergdorf, who was on the youth team before me, who, who's now on the adult team. Uh, Mike Bradley, a good, good buddy of mine from North Carolina, who actually fished this tournament this weekend with, uh, he's on it now and he's competing on the world squad, uh, there's more and more people that I kind of grew up fishing with that are making it and that's, that's making me want to compete on it more. But at the moment, I'm just kind of enjoying taking a break from the heavy duty competitive scene and enjoying a few comps here and there. That's really cool. Yeah. And it's a kind of an interesting segue too to kind of talk about kind of evolutions in gear and approach from the time you were winning medals to today. You want to kind of comment on kind of what you've seen happen in the last four or five years? Yeah. Um, there's definitely a change, you know, like I said, uh, back then it was pretty much a 10 or 11 foot rod. You know, there's one or two guys on the team who really liked 11s, everyone else fished a 10. Now there's a lot more versatility with the 10 and a half foot 
that I said uh, I've been enjoying using. So, you know, there's different rods. There's probably uh, back then, you know, you had sage, you had grays, some people fished hardies. And really, you know, there's you know, that was about it. Uh, then Cortland came on the scene with some nymphing rods. You have Douglas, um, Syndicate, Harbinger, and now Master Nymph. And these. so you got a lot more options. Um, but honestly, as far as rods go, you know, it's really, I, I've really enjoyed the Master Nymph. It, it's definitely a whole different animal from any of the other rods I've fished, but it's more about getting used to something than the specific rod. Um, moving on to reels. Reels have never really been a big deal in a competitive game other than for balance. So, you know, there honestly isn't that much of a change in the reels. Uh, a lot of different leader setups, you know. But uh, hooks and beads is something that I've seen a lot of people start carrying, and everyone's got their own opinion on that. Um, Tippet hasn't really changed that much. you got Trout Hunter, which has always been a staple. But uh, honestly, I've, I've been a little disappointed by them as of late. In the past couple of years, it seems like quality has gone down. Uh, Cortland's come out with a really, really solid Tippet brand for fluorocarbon. Um, and I, I've got some ears to the ground that are, that are saying that, there's going to be a few more coming on the market soon. That'll be top notch as well. That's really cool. Um, are there any common mistakes you see people that are just getting started in competitive angling or people that are just recreational fishing with a Euro nymphing setup? Are there any like common mistakes that you see them make like almost always? Um, as far as the competitive thing, you know, the, the most common mistake is people just, absolutely freak out when they get into a competitive standpoint um i've seen it happen with people that i fish with for quite a bit of time a lot of times on the youth team you know I've, I've helped teach them through clinics and then you know you see them get to nationals and they just absolutely fall apart um so that competitive mindset is something that's picked that that's kind of difficult to pick up but on the other hand part of that is not taking it too seriously and being able to brush things off as they go wrong um from just the standard Euro nymphings, you know, mindset, people maybe who are ever planning on competing, but are just Euro nymphing to catch more fish. I say a lot of times people focus too much on what they're told and what someone else does versus actually trying a few different things and learning on their own. Uh, if I, if, if I had just listened to, you know, people, my first year or two were always trying to get me like even coaches on the youth team didn't want me fishing the leader setup that I fish with, but I, you know, that's what worked for me. So I wouldn't try and force that on anyone else. I might get them to try it, but I'd say, uh, just from a standard non-competitive angler, just, you got all the time in the world to figure out what's right for you. So don't get too locked into something that maybe isn't the way that you'd like to fish and maybe isn't the best for you. And that, that, that really goes for leaders, you know, flies, maybe this rod isn't great for you. It's just kind of trying it all out and figuring out what's good for you. Yeah, very cool. And you kind of talked about kind of kind of relaxing and kind of letting the fishing come to you. Can you share with us how you approach a beat and how you break down water when you fish competitively? Yeah, and and that's something that right off the bat, one of the first things you talk about from a competitive standpoint at a clinic with kids, it's saying you need to. It doesn't matter. I, I, we would rather you start five minutes late in your session than not look at your entire beat. Because <clears throat> even as an experienced angler, I, I can't tell you how many times, you know, I've I've spent too much time in a bad part of the beat. And that, that may be, you know, there's a lot of different reasons that could be, you know, so maybe you think that this kind of water type is good right now and it doesn't produce, but you're just trying to hammer it down and figure out why it's not producing when 50 yards up in the riffles is where all the fish are that day. It might be bad information from someone, which kind of goes into the part where you need to have people you can rely on. Um, but I almost exclusively fish bottom up, even if I know that the bottom part of my beat isn't the best. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost as much of a process thing of just starting from the bottom and working up and properly working water than anything else. There's select instances where maybe I know that all the fish are in one part of the beat and I start there so that I can hammer out a bunch of fish. Then I move back down to the bottom, fish up hit the good water again, maybe run back down to a few other good spots and then try and hit the good water one more time. There's no set way to do it, but as a baseline, you know, start at, scout your beat, know where you want to be spending your time and then start at the bottom and work through water quicker or slower, depending on what you got in front of you. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, when you're going into a session, um, is there anything in particular you're looking for? Uh, it depends on, you know, the, the river and the day. Um, back then, you know, we'd always pre-fish, so we knew exactly what we were looking for. Nowadays, it's, you know, you, by the, by this point, you know, most of the people who've been doing it for a while know what fishy water looks like. And if it's winter, you know, you're probably going to go find somewhere deeper and slower in the spring with sun out, you're going to be hitting those riffles where there's a lot of bug activity. Um, but I'd say more than anything, you know, you, you look for those couple of really good sections of your beat, kind of get an idea with what you've got and then hit those hard and work the other parts of your beat to kind of rest the good water. Um, but yeah, that's, that's about it. You know, just kind of identify your really good looking water, your deeper troughs, your fast riffles, you know, anywhere that you think is good and just having that in the back of your mind so that you can focus on those areas during the session. That's really interesting. And how, how much do you, of a difference do you think gear makes in being successful? I'd say that more so than anything, it's the gear that people don't think about, you know, anyone on the team that I fish with can pick up any rod and reel and go, you know, outfish anyone else out there pretty much. But what makes the difference, and this, this is something I kind of was going back to, uh, I keep going back to that session with Calvin, um, having the right setup, you know, for your net is a big thing, having the rod and reel leader you're comfortable with, but something that a lot of people don't think of that, that is kind of the last step in differentiating yourself from an angler, an angler of equal or better skill is your tippet, your hooks, and your beads. If I went through, I've got bags and bags of hooks that I'll never use that I tested out. Uh, I've had to switch brands before, you know, I I fish almost exclusively Hanex or Fulling Mills, preferably Hanex right now. Because when you're fishing with someone uh, on like a world-class level, regardless of country, you know, you might both have a very equal beat and the person who squeaks out two extra fish is the one who's going to take the the first place in that session. And if you're equally skilled, you're probably going to get as many eats, hook as many fish, but having something as simple as the right hook, for instance, in Ireland, very skinny water, mostly smaller brown trout. I tied essentially all of my nymphs on dry fly hooks, very, very, very fine wire down to the point where we were picking our points, you know, a a curved beak point versus a straight point based on the fish, the water, how they were eating that that's kind of a realm that people don't think of. And it's very tough to just dive into. It takes a lot of testing, but I can't preach enough. What a difference the right hooks make. And it's, it's not a one size fits all. You know, I usually fish Hannock jigs. Now, if I was fishing dry flies, I'd probably throw Hannock or, um, occasionally other brands that still usually hannock dry fly hooks um i use some off-brand streamer hooks that i've just really come to like uh but yeah having the right hook for the situation can make an absolute huge difference and going back to that session with calvin again it was small brown trout small stream and i was using fairly thick hooks which you know they're they're sharp enough they're fine for larger stalkers but small wild browns you need to be able to, they eat and spit quick and you need to be able to hook them almost without setting the hook and having something that's micro fine with a needle point hook is huge for that. Um, and going back to tip it, that's another huge thing. You know, you, you're fishing, let's say in a three hour session, the amount of time that you spend rigging will eat up a huge portion of that. If you don't have the right tip it, you know, you might be breaking off on rocks or even worse, a fish that could have helped you out. So having the right tip it and be able, being able to fish down, smaller sizes for bigger fish and be confident in your ability to do that. That's another huge point. So hooks, heavy beads and tippet are, are, are in my mind, the most important sections of gear for a competitive angler. That's really, really, really good insight, Gabe. Thank you so much. Uh, do you have a favorite technique for fly fishing? Do you like streamer fishing better than your own nymphing or do you like throwing dry dropper or do you like throwing a single dry if you were just out on your own, what would be your favorite technique? In a competition sim, uh, setting, I almost never fish single fly. I, I rarely fish single dry. You know, it's got to be a really spe- specific situation like that time on the Quigley Green Ireland where I was throwing, you know, a 16, 17 foot light leader with one single size 16 or 14 dry. Um, 
a lot of people have picked up single nymphing for a lot of reasons. I almost never do that, even in the kind of water that, you know, you think that's perfect, perfect for single nymphing. Um, in a competition standpoint, you know, double nymphing, you know, heavier nymph on the tag, lighter nymph on point, or equally weighted is, is my go-to for pretty much every competition, regardless of time of year, location. Um, but as I've progressed more, I, I fish a lot more streamers than I used to in competitions, simply because you can fish heavier tippet, bigger hooks that'll stick fish better, and you can fish water really quickly and get fish in really quickly. So that's something that I've, I've really picked up on more so in the past couple of years. And that was actually a, a, a big part of the success for me in Poland. Um, because rather than fishing, you know, double nymphs and catching a bunch of small fish, uh, I'm thinking of a specific session on the Bialka river, uh, where there's an insane amount of smaller Brown trout, you know, 10 to 20 centimeters. And I was able to fish through sections with a streamer and target the larger fish that, you know, most people, you know, you catch five or six little fish and you, you either move on to heavier water where only big fish are going to sit or you just get tired of it and, and, and they, the fish stop biting and you move on. Whereas going through there with a slightly larger streamer, you still catch shorts, but more often than not, I was picking out the 20 to 25 centimeter fish out of there. Um, so I think streamers overall are pretty underrated competition technique. And there's something for instance, in this uh, last casting for hope where I fish streamers every session for a large amount of the session. Um, and I'd say that fishing streamers, especially for big trout, is probably my favorite technique if I was just going out and fishing. That's really cool. Here in the southeast, if you had a, to pick five confidence flies to put in your fly box, what would they be? So, And it's funny, it doesn't just go for the southeast. Um, and you'll see a lot of talk about fly patterns. And that was always a big, big portion of what we did in pre-fishing is fly patterns, this and that. It really all comes down to, you know, a couple of different flies and slight variations, maybe for the water. Um, a great fly that I would definitely have in a couple of variations is a, is a Frenchie. You know, that's the, that's the easiest May fly to modify, you know, just with that dubbing collar or a hot butt, hot collar. Um, so that's, that's a really good one, really versatile. Uh, the nymph that I probably fish more than anything is a uh, waltz worm with a either a sexy waltz worm, you know, sometimes different collars, but uh, these days I, I'm, I'm lazy. I just use the color bead that I want. Um, so there's two, three would be a hair's ear. I usually time a little bit bigger. That's, that's often going to be my anchor fly, maybe with a 3.5. And, and again, you know, all these flies are so versatile where you, know, you get different, different ribs, different collars, different kinds of dubbings. Um, so really those three are pretty staple for all competitive anglers uh, and that you'll find a million different variations, but oftentimes the simple ones are what work. In the southeast, I definitely have a small jig streamer in black, olive, tan, one of those kind of colors. Uh, on private water especially, those can be great, but even on public water, like I said, it's a great way to find fish and uh, spend less time nymphing slowly through areas, whereas with a streamer, you can kind of stick one or two and know where they're at and come back with nymphs. Um, and lastly probably just a stimulator yellow stimulator it's a great dry fly overall but it's great for floating nymphs so if you're in an area where you really want to be fishing a dry dropper which i personally don't do often because i like to fish faster with nymphs but it's pretty hard to beat just a stimulator as far as having a dry that'll float something and still catch a lot of fish i hear that do you have a favorite place anywhere in the world that you've ever fished is there anything that was just like holy sacred water to you Honestly, Ireland, I, people ask, and they're usually surprised by my answer, but that pre-fishing trip to Ireland was some, it was definitely the best trout fishing I've ever had. It, it was so good, even that we'd be testing different things. And something I found out that you could do is uh, over there, the bug life is absolutely insane. You know, you, you, over here, you got 18 blue wing olives. Over there, you have size eight and 10 blue wing olives. And you've got brown trout, which are extremely aggressive. You could literally fish a dry dropper and hold your dry fly six to eight inches above the water and have fish come out and jump and get it out of the air. Um, so it was a really unique fishery over there. Uh, over there, it actually had some really good sized fish in the streams. Uh, they're all really pretty wild fish, uh, and the lakes were something that I'd never experienced before. 
out in Colorado, you know, you have really good lakes and in the Southeast, there are a couple decent lakes, but very much less in the Southeast than other places. Over there, uh, we got the opportunity to fish one of the competition locks, uh, pretty much being the first people out there, save, you know, a few local anglers, um, for the fishing season. And we, we were able to go out there and strip as fast as we could with all kinds of different flies and catch absolutely huge rainbow and brown trout, um, nonstop pretty much. Uh, and, and then, uh, some of the more wild fish lakes, uh, you, you'd be stripping flies across the surface and having again, jump brown trout jumping out of the water for them. So Ireland was a really special place. And if I could go somewhere to trout fish, it'd be pretty tough to go anywhere other than that. Um, except for in the Czech Republic, there was one grayling stream we fished that, that was a, a really, really unique place. Uh, caught a lot of really big grayling there. So that was, that was another one to tie up on the list, but overall Ireland. That's awesome. And I know that, uh, you're a member of team dead drift. What's it like being part of a regional competitive fishing team, Gabe? That definitely was what got me my spark, uh, spark and my start in the sport obviously um i really enjoyed the camaraderie you know a lot of the guys on the the regional teams they go out there and they try and do well for the team but it, it's a lot more about camaraderie and meeting people and having a good time and i really especially more so these days uh appreciate and enjoy that rather than the the really high stress you know high competitive nature of a lot of the other teams um it's it's always it, you know it's a group of guys that are always looking to go fish in your area really good guys. And you know, we got our forums and our group chats that we're always messaging back and forth on. Um, so I, I love being a part of the regional team and it definitely gives you a lot of opportunity to compete. A lot of people who are going to try and get you to go out there and compete and do better. Gabe, it's just been an absolute pleasure having you on uh, our show today. Um, I can't say thank you enough. You've shared a whole lot of information with uh, a whole lot of people here. And that just shows a lot about your character and what you really like to do in the sport. It's, it's really interesting to see a competitor share so much information, uh, so freely. And we, we just really thank you for that because it could really, you know, show somebody, you know, a new love for the sport. So we appreciate that. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me on guys. I enjoyed it. Yeah, no, it's been great. And folks remember Tucker and I are trying to make this show for you. So please let us know on the articulate fly Facebook page, what you like about the show. If you have any suggestions or comments, uh, you know, for example, do you like the news? And even better, if there's someone out here there who wants to sponsor on the beat, please let us know. Uh, thanks again, Gabe Tucker. It's always fun hanging out with you and talking. Tight lines, everybody. Thanks, guys.